What's on tap today, homeschoolers? Latin. Latin? How's Latin going, Jack? It's quite miserable. Break it down for me. Give me some Latin. <laughs> Masculine? Femi feminine? Feminine. First declension. Singular and plural. Look at the teacher. Come on, Jack. Give me some Latin. No. Maybe tomorrow? No. <laughs> so we have a big surprise for you tonight. Big surprise. You like com competition, right? Yes. You'll like tonight. Okay. So Mrs. W, she's the competitive master. I learned that from Cody. So welcome back friends of the homestead on a beautiful Friday morning. It's what, 81 degrees. It's gonna be really hot today. We've got a really fun surprise for Jack tonight. It's a the annual paper, rock, scissors competition, and, and the competition is fierce. So we'll, I'll take you uh, down for that uh, tomorrow. That'll be on tomorrow's video. So today on my three things, we've got three household projects that we need to get done. One of the things that I have been, you know how you have those things that you put off for years and years and years that are just a constant annoyance? I know I keep speaking to this, but I guess when you have a big piece of property and you have um, five outbuildings, uh, the opportunity for projects is, uh, well, it's qu quite a target rich environment. So one of the things that's really been bugging me is this is the access door to my wood shop. Now, it's stuck. It's been stuck for years. And the worst thing is, is my best extension cord, one, at one time it opened. I don't know what happened and then it wouldn't open. And it's one of those things where like when you're doing other things and you grab it and you, sh you, know, you shake it and I grabbed the screwdrivers and I've, it, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I understand how a door works. It shouldn't be this complicated. And I would put pry bars. I think I even had turned Brian loose on, it, loose on it one time. He couldn't figure it out. So we are, nothing's happening until we get to the bottom of this. So some folks have asked about the My Three Things projects. Well, what happens if you don't get through them all? Well, it's simple. If you only get through one of the three, then the second one moves to the top of the list on the next day. You may not, you know, you may have a regular job that you can't, when you come home late, you don't have time to do projects and you push them for the weekend. So you rotate that up. So let's get this to the bottom of this door and then we'll move on to uh, a couple of other projects. There it is, my best extension cord. It's been trapped. You can't, it's got the ends too, but it can't get it in, can't get it out. It's just kind of stuck here. All right. So obviously it's sticking. Are you joking? So you're going to tell me I do all this build up and it's going to open? I know what it is. It's swelling up in the winter time. It's, it's the end of summer. It's bone dry. The wood has shrunk. I, I quit trying it months ago because I, I just didn't think it was possible to open it up. I keep looking at that extent. All right, so let's find out where it's rubbing and we'll plane all that down uh, so that it'll open hopefully in the winter time too. Here's a helpful hint for you. Something I did uh, that has uh, made, made life a lot easier. I did it, I think earlier this summer is I went through all my tools. I laid them all out, laid them all out on the concrete floor in the shop, made hard decisions. Okay, so do I have, how do I, uh, have I used this thing? Uh, if I haven't used it, get, get rid of it. And I organized everything. So this of course is the carpentry box. I put, uh, I got these boxes. I did one for carpentry, one for electrical, one for plumbing. Um, there were a couple other you know, specialty things, tile and stuff. Uh, but what I've done with these is um, I work out of them. So it's always changing, you know, but what, but the good thing about it is everything you need's in here. So it's not super frustrating. You can grab your uh, uh, saw horses, uh, grab your carpenter's box, and usually you have pretty much everything you're going to need in here. So we need a nail set so we can uh, push those pins out. When you push the pins out of a door, uh, best thing to use is a, is a nail set. And taking a look from the inside, we can quickly see the problem. Here's the problem. The problem is, is we've got, this is called reveal. When you, the distance between a, you know, a door and a jam right there. You want a little bit of reveal. And what ha what's happening here, I can see, is right now, even when the wood is really shrunk and dry, 
right there, you can see no light through there. See, that's tight. So that's what's happening is that the door is swelling, the casing is swelling, and you cannot get the door open for the life of you. And I mean, you, you can't pry on doors with glass with lights in them because they'll break. So that's why I haven't been able to get it. So let's pop it off here. Let's take and let's plane all this down so we can match this reveal. And then we're not gonna have any problems with that door. So what do we got here? We got some old school door pin hinges. Those are not gonna come out. That must unthread. I'm not familiar with that. So this is exactly why. Now life is frustrating, right? So it's all about eliminating frustrations. And that's why the toolbox is so handy because before I would have had everything that I thought that I needed and it would not have been a pair of channel locks. And then I'd had to go back to the shop and you know, all that stuff. So having the toolbox makes it, you know, makes, makes things so much easier. I'm assuming these just unthread here, huh? It's a nice, big, heavy, solid core door. Now that's confusing. I, I, uh, they've got threads in them. I unthreaded them, but there's no threads here. Oh, the thread must be in the hinge. And then these things fell out. I don't know where they came from. They must be bearings. That must be the, the wear. They look like maybe they're copper. They are a bearing. They're definitely a bearing. Look at that, bearings. So this is our problem area right here. This area, almost all the way down, tapers down to the, the handle is sticking. So we can plane this down real quickly. You could use a belt sander if you don't have a plane, but just, I want to mark it when I'm planing down, because you lose, you, you, you say, okay, I want to take an eighth off, but you forget you know, how deep you are. So take your pencil, use your finger as a depth stop like that, and kind of just estimate you know, what, what you want there. I want about an eighth to three sixteenths. And I'll just run it along there like this here and make a mark. And as I come about to the halfway point, I'm going to start decreasing and pushing it back and just estimating. So I tail out and go to nothing. One of the best things I've ever built was a dedicated blade and tool sharpening station. Before I built this, I found I was, I was very lazy with sharpening. It was, you know, such a process, such a chore that I, and you know, just kind of tended not to do it because I wasn't really set up to do it very well. So having everything here, and all my angles and everything preset with these blocks uh, makes a big difference. So I use these uh, guides here. Um, I don't know, maybe some people say it's cheating. Uh, I don't do it for a living. You do this every day, you get good at it, but when you do it well, you know, every few months or so, it's nice to have a, a little help. So these little guides, I've got a video on it on how you can uh, get a cheap one um, and then kind of fix it up. The, the, the really nice ones are super expensive, but you can get these cheap ones. The problem is, is that they're poorly made and the castings are not very precise, uh, but with a little bit of work, uh, you, can, um, you can get them all uh, working. What I've done on my sharpening table is on this side, I've put two blocks that are preset 25 degrees and 30 degrees for planes. On the other side, you can see over here, these, these two are for chisels. So for the planes, what I do, uh, when I'm ready to sharpen, let's say we'll take this one to, we'll take it to 30 degrees. I simply slide it on there and press it into my gauge, press the gauge against the side of the plywood and lock it. And that angle is preset. I don't have to refigure it all the time. If I want to do 25, I can bring it out there to the 25 and do the same thing. But let's do 30 on this one and then we'll hit it real quick with the diamonds and then we'll have a nice sharp blade that's going to just be super skookum. For our sharpening, we're going to be using the awesome Paul Sellers designed uh, three diamond stone deal. This is uh, this was his design. I watched his videos. I, I was a you know I'm a, I'm still a big fan of Paul Sellers. He actually got me into woodworking. He's this guy. He's a guy in England. He's a master woodworker, um, and he takes the pretension out of traditional woodworking. Um, I don't think he likes me though. I, when I was in, I, I've reached out to him a couple times and I've always been really careful to give a lot of credit to him um, because I, you know, I don't know anything about woodworking and I've always looked to him as kind of being my, my mentor. Um, and so I've done and recreated a lot of projects that he's done. For example, this, and I built the, I followed his instructions and I did a video series on my uh, traditional carpenter bench or poor man's carpenter's bench. And when I reached out to him when we were in London, I thought, you know, it'd be really cool if we could, you know, just stop by and say hi and, and maybe shoot some video. Um, I got less than a warm response. So I, I don't know if it was, if, if they're put off that I, 
have built or kind of recreated some of their videos. I didn't mean to give offense. I've always uh, tried to give credit where credit was due, but I, I, I kind of get this vibe that there's some bad blood there. I just don't know why. The thing that's so good about this sharpening setup like this is it's just so fast. From the time you put the, the planer down, you can be sharpening and have it sharpened in, in less than two minutes. And, that, and that's really good. So you're more, more apt to keep your tools sharp. Now, what I found with your stones, if you do, if you get these diamonds and you uh, build this deal, um, the, the water, if you, if you don't pull the stones out, uh, the water will get in there and swell the wood really bad. It doesn't dry underneath. So what I do is I just lift them out of there. Um, and then when it's nice and dry like this, and then just set them up there and they'll, they'll dry in no time. And then we can put everything back together here. Whatever you sharpen, no matter what it is, don't forget to strop with leather. Now, some folks ask what this white stuff was that I was putting. This is on, on the leather. This is just leather that's just bound to a, uh, um, a piece of wood. And this is jeweler's rouge. It, it's fine. You know, like a toothpaste. Toothpaste has, uh, I think it's pumice. A fine, you know, kind of an abrasive grit in it. This is a, just a super fine abrasive grit. What this does is, is it brings those points of steel um, together and uh, takes care of that wire. So you can you can just hit that and you can really notice it. Just a little, just a few passes with this, it all puts a mirror-like polish on whatever it is that you're using. Just like we did with the axe the other day. You can even run it flat there if you want to knock that wire off. But that's that's sharp right there. So sharpening and setting up a hand plane are, are one of those essential skills um, that every man uh, should have. Um, I was a little late coming to this. I mean, I remember my, I think my dad had one, you know, like an old Stanley plane in the, you know, in the, in the shop years ago, but that was just something that just wasn't used in commercial construction. It was kind of a thing of the past. And, you know, of course, it, you know, they're never taken care of and never sharpened and probably never set it from the factory correctly in the first place. And you may grab one and try it and like, oh, this is rubbish. Uh, but you, uh, once you learn, learn to use them and set them up, they're really good. Also, I, there are folks that always take offense when I gear the channel or, or explanations toward men. Um, there's always some women that are looking to be offended that come in. And, and if you're looking to be offended, as my dad says, if you look hard enough for anything, you'll find it. Uh, looking to be offended and then make those comments and it's not uh, it's, I, I don't say that to be offensive, but you know our, the, the subscriber base here is 90 almost 97 percent male. So uh, uh, You ladies that are being offended you you know, I think you need to you know get over yourself It's um, it, it doesn't mean to be off offensive uh, it's Just you know, can't we all have our own things you guys have your things and we can have our things We're not all the same. So uh, there are some women here and we and of course, you're more than welcome, but uh, most of them, most of them don't take offense. I think it's just a small minority of, uh, of hateful feminist types. Once you think you've got it, go over, over to one side, hold to the edge here and cut a ribbon. Okay, there's our ribbon for the left side. And then we'll cut a ribbon to the right side, right there. And we'll compare them, look at the two. And if everything is equal, like these two, they look pretty much equal. This one's a little bit thicker. So when you have one that's thicker, what you can do is we're cutting a little deeper on one side. We'll move it back a little bit. And I hit it one more time. Ribbon. Oop. Ribbon. Right there. Yep, we're good. So let's go plane our door. You're probably asking yourself, why use the plane? Why not just use a sander or a belt sander? Well, you know, I you could definitely do that. Um, you know, production-wise, if you're a contractor, you're not probably not going to use a plane for something like this. But I like to find, you know, any opportunity I can uh, to to stay proficient with the old tools. Make sure that I remember how to how to sharpen them, uh, how to use them, because the, the thing about it that's so different is. Uh, uh, there's no consumables in these old ones. When these were sold back in the day to a carpenter, uh, it was expected by both sides uh, that to, it would be a lifetime tool, probably multiple lifetimes, uh, if you weren't using it every day long. And user serviceable, meaning that with a, a sharpening stone, uh, you could maintain it and keep it working perfectly forever. No more inputs. You never have to purchase anything again from Stanley. Maybe if you wore through an iron, but that's, it was a pretty low expense. A lot of the things that were sold today, there are manufacturers that even will sell products at a loss 
because they make so much money on the consumables. I think a perfect example are those, uh, the little oscillating theme tools. For some reason, when you go to buy those things, I mean, they are horrifically expensive. Like you go to Home Depot and there's like a two blade pack and it's like $38, you know, something ridiculous like that. I doubt they're making much money on the tool, making a ton of money on the little deals. So same with the belt sander. It's, it's the belts are not cheap, they're expensive. And then you have to get the cord out. You have to get the respirator out. You don't want to breathe all that stuff, especially when you're dealing with old wood, which probably has lead paint in it. So uh, safety glasses, you know, all that stuff. So sometimes, you know, just sometimes it's worth the extra 10 minutes, 15 minutes, even if it's a half hour, just more enjoyable process. And it keeps your skills up to date and uh, it's just more fun. So that's that's all done. I don't know, maybe 10 minutes or so. That's why we put the, the pencil line on there. That way I was able to, to uh, plane down to the pencil line and we knew know where we're at. You won't, you won't, if you don't have any reference points, you'll, you'll go too deep or not deep enough and end up doing the job a couple times. So there's other, something else that's kind of cool on this door that I was not really did, not aware of. Maybe we can get this functioning. Look, it's got latch pins. So I notice on really windy days, like winter time, sometimes that door will rattle a little bit. If we could get these to function right there, we could, we could, uh, Eliminate all that door rattle. Oh, sure enough, looks like they're free. They're stuck with a little paint on there. So you pull this guy here. That's pretty nice. Man, that's a fancy door back in the day. That locks that locking pin. It's finally time to liberate our 100 foot extension cord. Let's hang this door in here and seal up the aperture. <laughs> I read a I le read a lot of uh, traditional English literature, and there uh, I would be careful because the that old antiquated language or uh, vocabulary kind of creeps into my own. It's just so so elegant, an aperture, meaning an opening. When I think of aperture today, it's a for ca it's camera related, but I guess it could refer to anything that is uh, any sort of an opening. This is just terrible trying to install these doors with that stupid bearing that's loose. It's almost like it takes, it's like a two man and a boy job here, I guess. And obviously there's a trick to it that I don't know. Okay, so it's not that difficult when you figure it out. So you hang the door, you get, it'll sit on the hinges, you get the, the pin halfway in, and then you can install these bearings. This is for your future reference if you come across these things. You'll be able just to tap that in there. Not so bad. Just another thing to keep track of. It's nice when they're, I like things to be all contained. There we go. While we're at it, we might as well get that, that uh, latch pin working, at least one, that'll help keep it from rattling. So what you can do to mark that stuff uh, every time is I'll just take a little bit of grease or if you're doing it quickly, just a little saliva, just get it wet on the top there. Close it, latch it. Strike it up, it comes in contact. Here we can see right there, we've got our hole. I've already kind of estimated the drill bit size. And then we'll drill this out here. Now, should we close it. Latch that up. Now we have a door solid. That's gonna be a lot less rattly. I think that's about all we have time for for today's video. I get to talking and I don't have time to show you all three projects. So we'll, uh, we'll pick up later on this. So I want it, rather than doing Manly Manders today, I wanted to address a question that uh, came up from several folks in the comments. And when I was talking, I think it was yesterday's video about um, our schedule and prioritizing and executing and being deliberate so that we have free time to do what we wanna do. Um, I mentioned from eight o'clock to 8.30 that we do family worship. And a lot of folks ask about that. What is that? We've never heard of that. Uh, can you explain or tell us what that is? 
Well, it's probably different for all families, but a lot of families do it. And I guess the way we look at it coming from a Christian background or perspective is that we want to give our best time what's best to God and what's first. Um, and so for us, uh, we have decided that it's, it's best for us to do it in the morning because when you get busy throughout the day um, and the cares of the world, you know, as C.S. Lewis puts all these troubles and cares and things you need to do come in like a roaring lion, you know, when you want to spend time with God, uh, all of the stuff crowds in on you. So to do it first thing in the morning is helpful for us. So it's a half hour. So what we do is we have, uh, we have three hymnals that we use uh, from, from our church. Uh, so we'll sing a hymn or two uh, together. It teaches the hymns to the kids and that there's always an uplifting message in those. Um, and then uh, we'll start reading. So right now we are working through um, when the, the time when Israel asked for a king. So we're going through how Saul was anointed by Samuel and then we'll go on to David and all of that. You can pick whatever you want. And so I'll usually pick a chapter and we'll have a discussion. So I'll start by painting the whole picture. Uh, this is what's happening in, in Jerusalem at this time. This is what's happening in Israel. And, and this, is, it, this is the relationship that they're having and, and the kind of paint a context and then go in and then read a bit of the story and then try to see how does that apply to us today. And the interesting thing that we always find is that same problems and issues and cares and concerns that they had back then are the same thing we have today. You know, if we think we're, we're so advanced and we think we're so different, human nature doesn't change a whole lot. That's why it's so relevant. That's why it's so we can see it's, it's such an advantage to see what happens when you make a, go down a particular road um, and then you can avoid those pitfalls yourself. That's why the 66 books have been preserved. That's why they've been given to us uh, so that we can see, hey, uh, you're not the first person to go down this road. and You're not the first person uh, to have had to make these difficult decisions and have had these struggles. Uh, folks in the past have had them. And the other thing that's so encouraging and one of the greatest proofs that the Bible is truth to me uh, is that um, the, the heroes of the Old Testament are not portrayed in the best light. They're portrayed as real people uh, with real with, with, with weaknesses, uh, making mistakes, um, and rather than just being perfect. Can you imagine how discouraging it would be if you were a, a struggling Christian and you look to the saints, you look to the, to the uh, heroes of the Old Testament and they were these amazing men of, of perfection and, and never, uh, never wavered and never made a mistake. I mean, you could never live up to that and it would be discouraging. Take, for example, when you start reading Egyptian history, Anytime that they made a mistake or they lost a battle or, or anything that, that maybe would portray the Pharaoh in a dim view, it just simply didn't happen. It wasn't recorded. You know, it happened, but they don't record it. They only recorded the great victories and the great battles and the, and the great accomplishments. So uh, you look back, you know, people who write their own history oftentimes, if not always, uh, leave out some of the more unsavory things or that they've done um, and shine a, a bright light on all of, the, all of the good things. So is that not a... Is that not a uh, snapshot of what we do today? <laughs> how easy is it to uh, focus on how good thing, the good things that we do and we do things that are a bit uh, off color, a little shady? Maybe not so much. All right, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys on the next video. Friday, September 7th, hateful juice, carrots, celery, some yellow squash, lemons, apples, spinach, and kale. It makes me cry. It makes me cry.